you. I'm going to pass uh, it to, to Mike, uh, who is going to join us on the stage. Uh, Mike is a returning speaker of iOS. So he gave a talk himself, I, I don't know, a few years ago. You gave a talk about WWDC, I think. You took it to, to yourself to give a, a summary of the entire WWDC to everybody on the, on the, in the room. So, so it, was, it was an interesting talk for sure. And uh, I, I will give it to you today to talk about uh, a new topic. Take it on. Sure, thanks. Um, code to avert catastrophe. Yeah, thanks. I've actually given a few talks. Thank you, you know, um, Paul, for running the meetup. And also thank you for doing the announcements first in case I go over to be able to go directly to the breakout room. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, um, Jordan, for your interesting talk. And it's actually very great to be in DC, uh, to, to be with DC. Let me see if I can do the screen sharing here. Uh, can everyone see my screen? The closed caption, Zoom window is covering the play button. And so I can't play, let's see. There's a, there's there a button go. to move up. You got it. Okay. How oh, good. Okay. Oh, and I can't see my presenter notes. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Well, let's just go. Uh, okay. Hi. I'm sorry. I got to get my presenter notes up. Just a second. And of course, it's not working. No worries. Take a minute if anybody has something to do. It's the right time to do it. <laughs> well, anyway, here goes. Code to avert catastrophe. And what do I, thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Sanderson. Uh, you may remember me from such previous talks as Coding Defensively Against APIs. At my first talk at IO Soho in 2016, uh, it was at 2016. Uh, that's how long I've been doing this. Game of Thrones was culturally relevant. Um, and uh, I actually worked on the app for the Game of Thrones books, um, which was fun. That's why the first one is not the show. Um, I would actually want to go back further. I actually want to go back to 2014. Um, I don't know if you remember us here at the ladders. Does anyone remember that? Um, here we have, uh, that's, I was looking up the talk anyway. There's me with my giant forehead in the middle. It's a, a full house. Um, and you can see why when you see the speakers, there's another shot. Um, Chris Isoff, who needed no introduction then as this uh, creator of Objective-C.io. And Adam Ernst at Facebook, who was debuting Component Kit, which is really what I wanted to focus on a little bit tonight. Uh, Component Kit was something that they invented to do the news feed. And it had some really interesting, um, and I think it was really significant. I want to go back, uh, not just because it's old, but because it's, uh, they had to justify it in a way as this is the way to do mobile development in a way that you haven't really seen in some later uh, presentations of the idea. Uh, Adam Ernst, if you know, is an old uh, Mac developer. He actually had one of the first 500 apps on the App Store back in 2008. Uh, it was actually a Subway app. And the app was called iTrans. And that's how old it was, iPod, iMac, iTrans. In 2008, you would think iTrans would mean iTransit. And that is a clunky transition to a personal announcement, which I decided this year to come out as non-binary. What does that mean? Um, just that I've, not that gender can't change, but I've always known that term is applied. I made a, a conscious decision 20 or 25 years ago to just always buy clothes from the right department, always buy the blue deodorant, always, and just forget about makeup or hair or nails, just because it wasn't worth the hassle of trying to express myself. It's, gender is not my main issue. Um, and that decision is now repealed. So I greatly appreciate all of the what work that people have done. Um, like many things at LGBTQ, I think, mean, wow, amazing what the kids get to do these days. And I was like, wait a second, wait, I could, I could do that too. Okay. And uh, uh, as far as the, pro I only one slide of personal stuff. As far as the pronoun stuff goes, I mean, what a mess. I mean, I don't know if I have the most credibility or the least credibility. 
we have to fix this. English is way ahead of, no offense, Paul, but you know, you got the French Academy. English is a lot more flexible. We just have to dream. You're not making any statement about gender, especially if you know the person you're referring to. Um, you know, it should be polite to correct people, but not polite to ask why you're being corrected. Just, and this only applies to pronouns. It's just acceptance doesn't mean uh, tripping over making basic reference statements, in my opinion. I think by some definitions, I'm discriminating against myself. So I'll say I'm, I'm tired of this, but we'll find a way. One slide of personal stuff. Back to engine, but it does come back to engineering. Um, what does it mean? <laughs> don't do this, okay? Don't don't store your gender as a bull for so many reasons, of which uh, acceptance is just one. I mean, this is a little better in that gender can change. I, I mean, uh, maybe better, but what is nil here? Um, if this was a private variable and nil was wrapped with something that explained the meaning, that would be one thing. But like, are you just saying there's two options and or no option or might it be unset for business reasons logic reasons this this is just getting worse and worse with the bull uh this is maybe a little better but then the question is what are you asking about gender for um is this for analytics purposes is this just are you an art site and people have to display their gender in their profile do you need to ask about gender at all you might not, you might think you're a dating app. You must actually, I know Scruff, which is a gay owned business, doesn't ask about gender at all. They have a marketing campaign for their user, their gay app, but they don't ask you if you're male. If I had no requirements, I would do something like this. Um, I would, uh, but then again, no requirements. The question is, what are your requirements? What are you doing? And you just need to be able to defend your decision according to, this is engineering. You need to defend your decision based on the requirements. And you might think I'm just saying that it sounds nice, but I, um, for the last, most of the last 18 months or most of the last two years, worked on GX, the sports science app from Gatorade, which you might have heard of. Um, I worked on phase one first between to June, 2020. One of the great reversals in software engineering uh, in that um, we had a hard deadline because they had a whole marketing campaign planned for the 2020 Olympics. And so we had to get the app out because they are not going to delay the Olympics. Uh, and in the end, the, the athletes, uh, in the end, the app shipped on, the software project shipped on time. The Olympics were delayed. 2020 was quite a year. Um, it's recommendations for athletes. Uh, and you, oh, and let's see, where is it going? Oh, sorry. You must choose male or female. You, it's not, there's no non-binary option. So why is that? It's because it's a sports science app. They are making, they're saying science is in the name of it. They're making health claims based on their observations uh, that they, data they collected at the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. And by the time we got to gender, there were a bunch of, there was at least one other restriction, which is the Gatorade Sports Science Institute is in Bradenton, Florida, where I used to live. And you actually couldn't use it if, if your workout was at a temperature under 60 degrees, we're sitting around in New York in January, like under 60 degrees, of course, that's like out, you can't, how is the app useful? It was based on scientific measurements. They had to put that limit in. I think they adjusted it. Um, so I was totally satisfied by that. And then later, speaking of temperature, I was asked um, for user experience purposes, we don't want to code, uh, we don't want to ask the user their indoor temperature we just, just pass up 70 degrees. And the back end said, we must have a temperature, just pass up 70 degrees. And I refused to hard code 70 degrees into the post parameter because I said, this is a scientific app. I already know two degrees is the, the margin of error. And if you want to do that, that's your decision. But to do it as a front end input parameter with no distinguishing characteristic from the, uh, from the other data would not be the correct way to do it. You can and you know, they accepted that, um, it was postponed. Eventually they did collect all the information. This was a REST API. So I learned that they changed their minds when the app threw an error, but you know, that's uh, getting to that. The backend team was really excellent. Okay, uh, but what's, oops. Keynote. Okay, code to avert catastrophe. So this is my talk. My talk is in four parts. And all four parts, each part grows out, uh, is organically linked to all the parts that came before. I want to clear about that. Um, the first is I want to share a bug I found in March or April 
uh, authentication bug in an iOS app in the wild um, that I found and reported and was fixed. And I want to share it because you actually didn't need to be technical to find it. But if you're technical, you'll, you might appreciate it. Second, I want to talk about uh, the coming software apocalypse, an article in The Atlantic in 2017 that I, when I first heard the term apocalypse, I was like, oh, that, that's too much. Or, the industry is not that bad, but no. Um, and another book, 2019, Secure by Design. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about WWC 2016 in this thing. The bulk of the talk is section three, code to avert catastrophe, uh, the technical part. And then part four, briefly, if I have time for it, uh, what I'm calling an abusive and corrupt HR process. Please don't make any assumptions. It's really, I don't blame you if you find it unbelievable. I barely believe it and it happened to me. Uh, to be totally, I speak only for myself. No one involved in the meetup has approved or uh, signed off on this. Uh, and also I gave Work & Co every chance to, to deal with this internally. Um, and I thought that that was the right, and I put myself at risk it and harm my own case by giving it a chance to deal with this internally. So do keep that in mind. Okay. First, authentication UI bug. So what is this? Um, this is one, first of all, I like the, uh, if you are a security researcher, I always wanted to be a security researcher. And my idea of that title is you, you sort of, you don't just get to call yourself a security researcher. You have to actually find a bug in the wild and report it to, to earn that particular title. And uh, so I like the phrasing here. Um, they did fix it. This is the bug, uh, let's see. Oh, so the bug, the setup, sorry. The setup is that you've been, the, it allows an attacker to, who has access to the logged in phone, who has access to the home screen to bypass the authentication and view the last screen of the app. So it's medical app, it's highly sensitive. It requires authentication uh, when you background the app and come back to it, uh, at which point your data is supposed to be secure. And actually turning on screen reporting is part of the exploit. So at this point, the attacker has gained access to the phone at the home screen and they want to attack the, get access to what's in the app. The clip's only 10 seconds long. They open the app, authentication fails, authentication, wait, what was that? I just saw something there. What, what was that about? There it is. So even though, and you don't have to be technical to find, to identify the bug, but does anyone know, I don't know who's muted or if you can say in chat, does anyone know what the bug is? What's, what's causing this? Probably, I don't have inside information. Again, first talk after. Uh, it's almost definitely because they've hard-coded the disappearing animation from one to zero um, in that they've hard-coded the, the disappearing animation from one to zero and as a result, when it goes to disappear to the screen after the authentication failed, uh, it briefly flashes the screen. And if you have screen recording turned on, you can capture it and view the last screen of the app, which is obviously, this is a real bug because someone in your household could have access to your phone legitimately or illegitimately and might be a nosy person who tries to get past it. Um, you never want to animate, you don't really want to, you always want to do the from value to be the current value. So if it's already zero, you, you, know, you don't want hard code from one to zero, you hard code from current value to zero. Um, and the question is if the from value should always be the current value and the system knows the current value, why do I need to provide the from value at all? Good question. Um, here's this. A second point though about this, uh, so it's an animation glitch, but it would just be a glitch. A second point is that it's in memory at all because if you, you know, you can't guarantee the alpha value is going to be respected necessarily. You have to, if the app is not authorized the data, in order for that data to be protected, it has to be completely torn down. Um, that's the site. So it's not just an animation. It's an animation glitch because you bypass authentication, but authentication shouldn't be dependent on the animation being set up correctly. That data should be gone as soon as authentication is withdrawn or should be withdrawn. And then it should be recreated with new authentication Base ID opens the secure enclave. You get the key out of the secure enclave. You unencrypt the data then, only then. Um, the last point is that I mentioned as part of a longer complaint, and there's nothing against one of that. I was been for a couple of years. Um, I mentioned as part of a longer complaint that, you know, oh, by the way, I found a security bug. The person fielding the complaint immediately identified this, said, oh, they it was a much longer complaint. They said, you said a security bug, someone will follow up about that. 
And this person did follow up to, hey, can you give us more information about that? And that is the correct decision. This, they obviously had the training. If anyone says security bug, could be nothing, could be some crazy person, but like find out, follow up with them. And it's actually being, I think, written into regulations at this point. Like you, someone says security bug, you can't just say, oh, you, you're a malcontented person, just move on. You have to follow up. Maybe I wanna be a security researcher or maybe I would just let it be and then someone's data is compromised in the future. Uh, security is not a question of opinion. That is it from here. Oh, here we go. Always donate from the current value. You never want to glitch to a position and from there. Uh, your view is a function of the model state. So if you're authenticate, you're, the existence of your sensitive data is a function of your authentication model state. Uh, it has to be. Uh, and then you have, your people have to be trained to escalate and isolate and you know, pay attention to any security issue. Uh, and that's, yeah, I think, standard training. Uh, I'd like to ask a few questions now. I'm just going to keep going. Part two, the coming software apocalypse. So I heard the term apocalypse and like, oh, that's, no, that's like too much, but no. Um, it's in the Atlantic. The first story is about um, a total, a 911 outage for Washington state that lasted, um, I think six hours. Uh, the, fortunately it appears no one died. Uh, there was a woman, someone was trying to break in her house. She's calling 911, she can't get through. What happened? I thought it was an overflow imp bug. I looked it up for this talk. Apparently, someone just hard coded 40 million calls for the max number of 911 calls the system could handle as some sort of database system. And then it's further was a single point of failure, but the root cause was a programming error. And it's like, what is going on? And the author spends quite a bit of time talking about software is good, it makes many things possible. You could be nostalgic for the 1970s and finding, um, you know, the analog 911 system, but being able to text images to 911 is a good thing. You know, it's it's not bad. Mobile phones are a good thing, but it's the complexity. It's no one knows what it's doing. Uh, spaghetti code it was wrote, found to be really so-called unintended acceleration in unnamed brand cars. Um, spaghetti, not not things you want to see on the same line. But another point they make is often the bug is in the requirements. Sometimes it's a code error, but very often the software worked correctly. But the requirements for the use case were misconfigured. For example, we might know the Ares 5 rocket that uh, exploded due to a 64-bit pass to an unsigned int, the most, probably the most expensive one so far, $370 million and you know, et cetera. Uh, also, the Mars Climate Orbiter, eh, Mars Climate Orbiter, um, passing Imperial and metric uh, units conversion, um, probably NASA's lowest moment outside of loss of life. Uh, but some recent problems have been the requirements. Uh, the 737 Max. I don't believe that was a coding error. I believe that was they wanted to not market their plane as requiring training, so they put gave software the ability to put a plane into the nosedive. And I don't know anyone who works with software who would predict a different outcome from giving software the ability to put a plane into a nosedive. Um, and that's really sad. Um, and then also uh, gas lines in Georgia, a security issue, uh, get an outdated VPN, I, I think. Uh, an old VPN hadn't been reti retired. They got into the system and the pipeline was shut down. Uh, gas lines in Georgia, I don't know, gas lines anywhere would be bad, but. Mm, right. Um, the possible solutions. Um, it does mention SWIFT and it mentions this concept of light table and the idea of a more immediate response. Uh, this is light table. It says light table directly expired SWIFT and I think that's right. Uh, this supposedly directly inspired SWIFT playgrounds and it's easy to see why. And this is, this is part of the solution I think for sure. <coughs> My point going forward would be, uh, this is part of the solution as far as being able to say what it's doing, but why is still a little unclear as far as understanding the code on the right, as far as why the code is doing what it's doing. And you only get to see the state for one particular point in time, part of the solution, not the only solution. Secure by Design, which is a newer book, I think describes a big part of the solution. This is not an iOS book. Um, oh, right. So how to write secure code, the big secret. Here's how you do it. You want your code to be secure. 
You have to know what it does. That's it. There's no, and I, I got this training already. You have to know what your code does for it to be secure. If you don't know what your code does or only one person knows what it does, it's not secure because you don't know. Um, you have to know what it does. There's no, you have to know what it does. There's no alternative. Um, write everything with type safe interfaces. Again, this cannot, you can make your interface type safe. These people are domain driven design. They talk about doing domain objects that make sense in your model. And they spend a lot of time talking about that. And I, I think it's really, really excellent. They have some pretty bad anecdotes too. They have an anecdote about a book retailer that they don't name. Someone figured out if you have negative books in your cart, you'll get a, they'll send you a check. Uh, you can get negative and you manage to check out. They also discovered that would actually subtract books from the warehouse too. So books were disappearing from the warehouse. They sent the warehouse staff to some like tough love team building exercise because somebody upstairs made a coding error. It's just a nightmare that we live in. Initialization is key. Uh, you, you validate everything immediately. Everything is readable. Make impossible states impossible. Clearly Swift has a lot of and also the WRC 2016 guidelines. And I was there. This is a personal photo. What's doing Swift? I was in like the third row. This is Chris Latner. And I was super excited. That's the elements of style behind him. And because I used to be a writer, uh, I love the elements of style. I was super excited. Uh, the note below, he has, uh, these are Swift API, dis uh, Swift discussion group inquiries. Um, so it was known what was coming with Swift 3.0. I actually got a, the cop, a copy of the Ellen Saw signed by Chris Latner and Dave Abrams, uh, by which I mean I downloaded a picture of the cover and had them sign the iPad with the pencil and I stuff didn't even belong to me, but I still have this image. I guess I should send it as, sell it as an NFT or something. Uh, but I, I took this very seriously. I think this is part of the solution to make the code readable. And I thought this was great to see it. The video is no longer available, which is too bad because I don't remember what this slide was about. What was the Giant pile of bananas. Uh, okay. In the labs, I had a long conversation with Dave Abrams. This is the lab. This is that last year at Moscone, maybe the last year ever in person. Well, last year at Moscone, if the last year ever in person. Um, and I had a long conversation with Dave Abrams. And, you know, we actually, the big takeaway was I talked about the type inference system. Because remember, he said, omit needless words, omit needless words. If you remember that era, like, you know, is the type inference system good enough to omit? the types, and he assured me the type inference system was good enough um, when we were doing. The Great Migration sometimes gets blamed for this. The fact that it was called the Great Migration for the problems of Swift 0.0, if you remember that era. Um, I had to migrate to Swift 2.0 after 3.0. Lowercase enums were the biggest headache. I had like, and in the Swift, I had to look back on the design guidelines. We had like three messages of discussion about that. Someone noted that the open source process was sort of dominated by people who don't actually have to ship stuff. Like by definition, if you're too busy to participate in the process, you weren't part of the process. I just say that to say like openness period is not the answer. Omit words, it's not omit needless, it's omit needless words, not omit words. And the typist is, I was personally sure is not the task. We later learned in 2019, the type checker was just guessing the exact location of an error, which mm, now nah, that seems about right. I think it was not guessing the location of the error. I think it was making an assumption and then three steps down, it was giving you an error based on the incorrect assumption. And what you really had to do was just add a bunch of type information and it would eventually be able to figure it out. Uh, do exactly what Dave Abrams personally assured me that you didn't have to do. It's fun. Code to avert catastrophe. Paul, how are we doing on time? We're not even on section three. I know that might be the longest part, but we're already at 6 p.m. Uh, feel free to, to do that part. I'm not sure we're going to have for, for part four, have time for that, but, but please ha have this one for sure. Okay, okay, I'll move through it. Um, code to avert catastrophe. Here we are at Meetup. Uh, this component kit was released in 2004. Uh, this is not just at ISO, but there's a longer talk at, at Scale 2014 Mobile. It's their conference. It's helpfully divided into chapters. It was also an objective CIO issue, React inspired views. 2014 was so long ago. Why do I care? Mike, you're old. We get it. Uh, still in use at Facebook, other place still worked. And because they really broke it down for the requirements, it's also worth watching and it's divided into chapters. What's the matter with core data? Um, it's worth it to see them. Like, I don't want to say it's worth it to see trash core data because it's not about 
core data is good or bad. It's what's the matter with core data for their use case. It's the Facebook newsfeed. It, uh, we all know what that is. We know how fast, number two, runtime performance. We all know how fast you scroll through the Facebook newsfeed. Uh, it's core data was not fast enough. And these people were experts in it and they said it's not fast enough. Number three, programming model. Core data doesn't score up to like multiple, having 20 people working on the same project. You know, Facebook puts 20 people on every feature. So you can't have 20 people working on the same data model. It's what are your requirements? It's not core data is good or bad. You're a single person working on a to-do list app. Core data is probably great. You know, they just, this is just more and more, uh, they really looked into it. It's very important because you can hear people say, well, core data is good if you, core data is good if you know how to use it, not it. They also looked at the durability of it. And it's the Facebook newsfeed. It's backed by web services. You know, if, if your app is backed by web services, you don't need to use core data is not designed to solve your problems. It was still relatively novel in the early days of the iPhone that I'm totally backed by web services. Um, Here's a very familiar problem we've all had. Your thing didn't size correctly. They're like, how do we fundamentally solve this? Do we want to use unit tests? Oh, and I'm sorry, in the description, I said test passenger development. I'm not going to have time to get into that for many reasons, but I am working on a, a blog post on the uses and lack of uses of unit tests. This is a great example. What are you going to do? Unit test your size changes? Unit tests that height changes propagate? There's an infinite variety of changes. You know, If not test, what? Well, let's look at their background. How did you, how did they build their app? First, the first step, anatomy of feed UI. Yeah, no problem. You know, this is, the, we're all on the same page here. You, you look at your designs, you make views for your designs. Great. You then back them by a giant view controller. This is the classic method, massive view controller. But really you probably want it, let's put a controller for each thing. Let's do that. We're still only at one, a feed only has one post and one like view, one sub view. We connect it to our model, looking a little hairy. What happens when we like? When we like, it goes through the lag control, back to the model store, but then it affects heights. Everything propagates everywhere. Like there's like eight lines here. Data and events flow everywhere. So what do we do? And this is their graphic. Unidirectional data flow. And I put these arrows in. You have your model. From your model, you make your component. From your component, you make your subcomponents. This is one step, 1A, 1B. Every time your model changes, you rebuild your component tree. Your component tree maps your view. That's it. That's the whole thing. And the real benefit is it makes it really easy to reason about. This is an example of a leaf component. A leaf component is sort of like a view, a light view model in that all it is is a collection of data that in order to create it, you must give it all of the information it needs to propagate itself. And it's a type safe interface. It's very clear. Uh, it's exactly the code. This is uh, Objective C++. And they spend a lot of time why they talk about Objective C++ for reasons that are entirely obsolete. Uh, type safe initialization. Uh, this is, there we go. Three things in this header. There's an image, there's some text on the top, there's some text on the bottom. To create your component as a designated initializer, you give the three things in the format. Note the timestamp is a string. This is the designated initializer. You, can, I think at least, you can pass your model objects like your NF date and do your formatting in your initializer, but you should probably, your designated initializer is probably your, uh, it has the ultimate values. There's simple NS objects. This is the same thing I said in my 2016 talk. Number one, start with the view. What does it need? Number two, create a static init. And you need to do static init or static constructor because inits, you only have one way to construct each time. And the static init gives you an important thing. And then step two, continue to adjust and maintain. By defining your view as, or defining your view model, which I call the command, you might call it an action, you might call it a component, you might call it a light view model, this term is used everywhere. Um, you can then build your thing from your wireframes and later when you have your model, replace it with something more sophisticated. And if you're type safe end to end, you go each way. 
This is another way to look at it, uh, going from left to right. Uh, I prefer to go model to view always left to right. You have your model. From that, you build your whole story component. And then to some degree, the infrastructure will build your view hierarchy from the component tree you give it to. So go from this on a change to this. Um, and notice the view model, uh, the one-way sign has, has transported itself. Whoops. Uh, because the, the horizontal axis here is now time. And this was the huge innovation of, of, of Facebook's component kit, which is that this you can give it, you give it for any given time. Your model is in this state, you give it this component tree. Your model's in this state, you give it this component tree. Your model's in this state, you give it this component tree. You probably want to do the stuff on the bottom, the green arrows that connect it to the view, but you do not want to do the part from one to another. And it goes back to that question from part one. If in animations, the from value should always be the current value and the system knows the current value, why do I need to provide the from value at all? And let's, let's modify that. If in everything, why do I have to provide the, you don't. You just provide the new value and the system goes from the current value to the new value. And the reason to do this is because it's much, much easier to reason about. By now, this should seem pretty familiar. If you call it a snapshot, this is difficult data source. This is IG list kit, which removed collection view from needing uh, insert cell, insert row, insert whatever, la la. The view is a pure function of the model. So notice this also fixes our issue of uh, authentication. The view is a pure function of the model. So if you're building your whole tree every time you want to, uh, you, you can put a mechanism in there. The existence of a view with su uh, sensitive data is a function of your model having correct authentication. And you can build that in there. You also sort of provide the view description. Uh, yeah, and you provide the only bit. Do the hard work for me. This is a slide. This is the view hierarchy I want. You know, this is the layout I want. This is the state change I want. Declare all the things. Do it all declaratively. This is the solution that's been worked on for like six, seven years. It came from React. These pictures were in sequence. Aren't just do the hard work for me. There's me taking notes. Do how do you do that? Let the oh, let the record show that I attended a so-called meet up uh, after hours where alcohol was served, and I took notes on how to have work done for me. I'm clearly something is going wrong. This is the view. So first you do them all. Again, very easy to reason about. What did you do? Oh, you must have a way to do the diffing. All right, what did I say? Oh yeah. React starts. Oh yeah. You must have a way to do the diffing. That's a necessity for this. It, the system must know how to do that. Must know a way to know when to update UI. Uh, that's why IG list kits innovation was the identifier to do this on cells. Is combined Swift UI this. Note that Swift UI has rules about knowing what triggers an update. This is because they need this information. The system needs to not update things without needing to know it. Uh, it's a pure function. Swift UI is a pure function. Uh, certainly in that sense it is. Another example of light view models came in WC 2019, mastering Xcode previews. Here's your model, an animal, this is presumably general. Note here we have uh, some, oh, some weird, uh, Weak variable, I know that's gonna give us problems. There's clade, what is that? Uh, here's your model, here's, this could be wireframes. Let's, you know, you see what's in your model comes to it. They call it a view model in the comments. They don't call it a view model in the name of the type. Quick question, what kind of app was this again? Wasn't this, was this a biology app that deals with you're an animal cell model and a plant cell model and a, you know, a, a, a bacteria cell model? Uh, you know, you know, call it a view model, it's okay. There's two definitions of view model. Also, this is the direction you wanna to go to. You wanna start with your views and these components where they have the value to power the views, you, this is the order you go and you don't need the model or the backend or anything to be ready at all whatsoever. It also means it possible to put a fluent API. You go into your Swift UI view, totally all your properties are in exactly the format they need. You can make your Swift UI Swift UI views look like this, and you could know, look at a glance exactly how you're doing your UI. And this is the goal of Swift UI. The goal is to make the places where decisions are made in your code super clear about what decisions are being made. This is the goal for the whole thing. 
I have this slide. This is my only non Game of Thrones talk in my first slide. I have it three times here. The first thing you're defensive against is absence of data. We sort of did that already. So you need to be able to construct these view models with nothing. The second decision is bad decisions of upstream. Uh, I notice of all the things to say code to avert catastrophe, and I use the Facebook news feed in 2014, talk about not averting catastrophe, right? What, what the heck, what's going on there? IG list kit, we know, we know what Instagram is responsible for. It's bad decisions upstream. This is the infrastructure. This is, this is the engineering. This is neutral. There is no, this step in the iOS app is not the source of the data change. Uh, the source of the data change happens in Menlo Park. Your job as an engineer is to make sure this part, what exactly propagates this is as clear as possible, specifically so non-technical stakeholders can see what is going into the decision if it's appropriate to do so. And I think by Facebook, we know enough at this point that that ship has sailed, that we don't get to see what goes into these news feeds um, with what we know already. And if you work at Facebook, yeah, I, I don't judge people without, uh, you know, if I haven't walked in their shoes. Um, a third thing though, that your defensive against is mishandling by the view. Note here, this talk where they showed you how to use the view model was in fact mastering Xcode previews, where they again call it a view model. Uh, and this is actually the next couple of slides I can sort of skip through because it was the first five minutes of Jordan's talk, which is, um, nope, but let me get to that. Apple is your biggest defense. This was from David Grandinetti, another uh, guy. He was a guy, I think guy is gender neutral at this point. I don't know. But it also protects you against your views. And can you, can you scale up view models? Yes, you can. This actually, and they did it this year. You can actually just having only designs, you can build these view models. You can build out your entire view hierarchy. If you look at the left here, it's really very, every view has a view model. This is in a, I've tried to fusicate the client's name. The client's totally lands. Uh, this is um, uh, the same organization that Jordan described. This is in a, module, which for Swift UI is apparently best practice because then you can import it into different sections. This is the hexagon architecture, conceptualizing the view as a walled garden that is so pure. And the only way you can get in the walled garden is through the special entry chamber of the view model, which can only provide only enter the view if you have specified all of the information it definitely needs. This needs to be in the module with the Swift UI views uh, also, because the Swift UI view needs to know about them to get the data out of it. However, your debug data does not need to be in the module. Your debug data can be in the, as, as Jordan put it, the lifeboat app, uh, which is to say, how do you get your compile time up? How do you get your Swift UI previews to work? You do file new app, you import your Swift UI components, and you do your experiments there. Your, make sure your data handles asynchronous stuff. Make sure your data uh, and you can also fill this up with your asset catalog with all your bug, everything in your asset catalog should be visible on, you should be able to copy paste from your graphic design program uh, into your asset catalog. And by putting it in the Lifeboat app, you guarantee it doesn't make it into your main app in any form, uh, if that's your goal, which I think it should be. But you still are able to use it in your, debug. you could even sign and ship your Lifeboat app as a, a, a temporary one if your backend is behind. So, and also, oh, and another thing here, what I realized working with another designer very closely was our iOS app imported the Swift UI library module. Well, it turns out the graphic design programs are designed the same way in that they have a library design program where they define their fonts and their colors and their uh, higher level components, which they then uh, import into a larger project where they do larger experimentations. And that made it very clear. We tried to replicate that structure and have a very good one-to-one -one mapping between things the designers did and things in the code. So this in their design files, this all one-to-one -one map to the designers things. Fonts, I was very happy with the way the fonts came out. Again, it's edums, it's a make, you must have this. We had hard-coded specs. So each one you had to part hard-coded specs. This gets a little bit, you don't really want it to be like every time you have a new property, you have to do it for everyone. So it actually went through another 
series of properties, which you could either return the hard-coded specs or you could modify it. Uh, this is Figma. We've seen so many versions of this, Zeppelin, Photoshop plugins, everything for how to get designs out. Someone somewhere in, in Figma land figured out what the NS mutable paragraph style for this was. The designer specified it in their interface and we got it out. And that's still getting those numbers out and having the one-to-one -one organization between this file, you can see on the left, heading one, heading one, one, heading two, heading three, H1, H11, H2, H3. I favored saying heading one, but I lost that argument. Okay, moving fast. And does this scale up? Yes, this is the debug data. Uh, it had to be moved to the module because we did want to ship it for a version, but it scales all the way up. You can build whole debug components just out of view models, as long as you're very strict about not building actual model data. Don't build actual model data. That's a mistake. Moreover, you can extend this end to end. Um, GraphQL, something else Facebook created, is another way to, to type safe interfaces about your API. Um, there's no magic. My understanding is Apollo server runs a JavaScript server on your machine and it checks with the server. And if your types don't match, you it doesn't let you compile. That's what it takes. And when you get this end to end, you know immediately, and you, as I said in my the part three, as things adjust, if the if they change something on the server, Apollo lets you know. You have to decide what what needs to be changed. Can this be nil? Is it a mistake? What do we do? And propagate that forward. And this gives you type safety moving forward during development. And what are you defensive against? You're protecting yourself against the API not being ready, so you can continue to develop. And we actually in one sprint built up. We're not behind it all on the debug layer, even though not. Uh, this is mostly to wrap up this section, one-to-one -one organization. Delegate your state change system. Like, you, know, you figure out which cells need refreshing. Don't ask me. Declare all the things. 